In my last video, I built this. It's a NAS that's built around a Raspberry Pi that uses a PCI Express interface to connect to a SATA controller card and the hard drives. Now this video did pretty well, and I received this comment here from JoeTheMan74 asking if I could take a look at Open Media Vault and set up the NAS using that rather than the command line. Now I think this is an absolutely superb idea, so let's go and take a look at how to put all of this together. Hello once again Pi Geeks and Techno Nerds all around the world. My name's Jeff and I'm an IT professional who's been in the industry for over 30 years. I've been playing around with Raspberry Pis since they first came out, and just like you, I really enjoy trying to find new ways to make use of them. And I want to share some of those ideas with you right here on this channel. If you like what you see, please hit that thumbs up button, subscribe if you want to see more, and also hit that notification bell so you can be told when I put a new video out. And also, let me know in the comments how you get on with some of these projects. And if you've got any ideas for projects that you'd like to see me do, leave them in there as well. In my last video, I built a NAS that was based around a Raspberry Pi 5 connecting through PCI Express to a SATA controller card and ultimately the hard drives. I then set up SMB sharing through this so I could access all of the storage from my Linux box and from my Windows box. All of this went really, really well, and I found that the performance was capped more by my gigabit network than the actual disk access speeds, which was absolutely superb. However, setting it up from the command line was kind of fiddly. And once again, many thanks to Joe the Man 74 who sent in this comment suggesting that I take a look at Open Media Vault. Now, Open Media Vault is a completely free GUI based solution for setting up a NAS. Its website is linked in the description below, but you can see that here. It essentially offers you a nice, easy to use way to set up all of your storage requirements. And what's really great about it is that it has support for plugins where you can extend its basic functionality in all new ways to support different disk types, protocols, and even run Docker containers. All of this in a really nice and reasonably easy to use GUI. And setting up Open Media Vault is really quite straightforward. They actually provide some scripts to really streamline the install process. Now, through this video, I won't be going through an awful lot of the detail of actually setting up all of the NAS hardware in the first place. If you want to see all of that, check out my video here. This will take you through everything on how to set all of the NAS hardware up. In this video, I'm only going to be talking about Open Media Vault. So let's quickly go through what you need in order to set this up. Now, all you really need in order to put this together is the Raspberry Pi OS. And in this case, I'm using the 64-bit light version of Raspberry Pi OS for the Raspberry Pi 5. And you'll obviously need a micro SD card to write that onto. Now, I use Raspberry Pi Imager to write the operating system onto the SD card. If you're unfamiliar on how to do this, you can see my video on the subject just here, and it will take you through step by step. It's really straightforward. Once you've got this installed, all you then need is to install the Open Media Vault software. Now, they don't make this available in all of the regular Raspberry Pi repositories, but it's really not a problem. They have their own GitHub site that you can see here. And again, I'll link to this in the description below. And on here, they provide an install script along with some instructions on how to run it. It's really simple to follow, but I'll go through that in just a second. And that's all you need to put this all together. So let's go and take a look at installing Open Media Vault. Now, once you've got Raspberry Pi OS written to your micro SD card, simply slot that into your Pi 5 and then boot it up. And once everything comes up, then you can SSH onto it, or you can connect a monitor, keyboard and mouse directly to the Pi 5 and access it that way. Now I'm connecting using SSH, and so I've got this terminal window available to me here. Now, one thing I found that was quite surprising was that I could already see the hard drives that are connected onto the Raspberry Pi 5. This means that the PCI Express slot is already configured. Now, previously, I've always had to enable this manually by making a change to the config.txt file, the location of which has changed in recent builds. So even though my PCI Express slot seems to be up and running here, I'll take you through how to set that up anyway. All you have to do is make a change to the file slash boot slash firmware 
slash config.txt. And if you just scroll all the way to the bottom and insert the lines dt param equals PCI EX1 and dt param equals PCI EX1 underscore gen equals three, then this will both enable the PCI Express interface and set the speed of it to be PCI Gen 3. This should give us something around 8 gigabits per second of transfer speed to our PCI device, in this case, our SATA controller card. After this, you just have to save that out and then reboot. Now the system is rebooted, the first thing I'm going to do is install the LVM2 and MDADM software. And now just before we get on with the Open Media Vault install, I'm going to reboot and just make sure that the file systems on our hard drives do show up. And now we're rebooted, if I run the LV display command, you can see all of the logical volumes that I set up in the last video are still there, still present and still viewable. I've not had to rebuild these. Equally, if I look for the meta device that we set up previously, that's the RAID 5 volume of these disks, I can see that as well. Now this is all brilliant because it's less that we'll need to do in Open Media Vault later, but I'll still take you through the process of how you'd do it. I just want to save a bit of time. Now, as I mentioned before, Open Media Vault actually provide a really handy install script that we can use to install the software. Now it's really easy to run, but I am going to use a slightly different command to what they do. I'm going to firstly take this command here that just downloads the install script. Now, as part of the installation, it actually resets your network device. Where I'm logged into my NAS through an SSH session, this means that that session will get killed. And normally, at that point, any script that I'm running will also die as well. Now, obviously, I don't want that to happen because I want this install script to run to completion. So I'm going to use a command called nohup that you can use to run a script in the background and regardless of what happens to your shell session, it will keep on running. First off, I'm going to become root and now I'm going to make that script executable. And now I'm going to run it using nohup. Now the little ampersand that I've put on the end means that the script will run in the background and any output from it will be written to a text file called nohup.txt. Now this install script also provides its own log file, which is really useful. So at the point where our session gets killed off, I'll ultimately be able to log in again and look at that log file to make sure everything installed successfully. But let's go for it. Now the script is running and I can see the omv install.log file there. So let's just tail that until the point where our session gets killed. And indeed, this is the point where my connection has been killed to the Pi 5 NAS. So what I'll need to do is kill this terminal session and restart it again. Now I've logged back into the Pi, let's just take a very quick look at its network interfaces. Here you can see the second network interface is END0. Now this is slightly different to what it was before, it used to be called ENO0 and Open Media Vault has actually renamed it and this is why my previous network connection got killed. However, the install script should have kept on running. So let's just take a look at how that's getting on. And here you can see that it's completed. So now let's see if we can get to the web UI. Here we can see the default web page for Open Media Vault. All I've had to do here is open up a browser and then just put in the IP address of my Pi. And this has come straight up. So please do bear in mind, if you do run this on a Pi 5 that's already running a web server, you may run into some issues during the installation where Open Media Vault is clashing with your default web server. In this case, I had nothing else running, so I'm fine. Now the default username is admin and the default password is Open Media Vault. And here you can see the basic dashboard. Over on the left, we get a nice little menu where we can go through system settings, network settings, storage settings, the services that we're running on our NAS, users that we've got configured, and some diagnostic information. Now, initially, if we go into storage and we look at our disks, we can see all of our physical disks, but we can't see our logical volumes, let alone our meta device. However, one of the beauties of Open Media Vault is its plugin support, and there are plugins available for both of these. 
So let's install those. If I just click on the plugins option underneath system here, I can then search for LVM2. And this brings up the LVM2 plugin. So I can just select that and then click on this little arrow here to install it. Now the plugin's installed, everything refreshes, and now under storage, I have an LVM option. And here I can see my physical volumes that are mapped from the hard drives, my volume groups that I set up previously for data and backup, and my logical volumes. Now, of course, I set all of these up in my prior video from the command line, but if you needed to do that from the GUI here, it's really straightforward. You'd start off with the physical volumes, hit the little plus icon for create, and then just select a physical disk device. And these would all be visible just from the drop down here. Similarly, for volume groups, you could then create in here. You could provide a name for it. And then again, map that to the physical volumes. Once you have that done, then you could go into the logical volume section. Again, hit create, provide a name for the logical volume, which volume group it belongs to, and then also you can adjust the size. Now, this is the one problem that I have here. From the command line, I can control the size directly via the use of what are called extents. And this gives me a very precise way of governing the size of a logical volume. In the GUI here, you can see that the size is only allowing me to represent a percentage of the disk space. Now, if you've got three identical data disks, you could just set this to 100% and everything would be fine. If you haven't got identically sized disks, you would need to set the size based upon the size of the smallest disk that you have in your array. Now, in order to achieve this and minimize waste, I would suggest you do this part through the command line and refer to my prior video for that. This will be linked both at the end of this video and also in the description below. Once you've got all of the logical volumes visible, now we need to make our meta device visible. And again, there's a plugin for this. Here, I'm just gonna search for MD. And if I scroll down a bit here, then you can see the Open Media Vault MD plugin. This is to set up what they label as multiple device. I've always known as meta device configurations. Again, I just select the plugin and then hit the arrow to install it. Okay, so here I've encountered a problem where it's failing at the last part of the installation. So what I'm gonna do here is close this and uninstall the plugin. If I just refresh the page, again, search for MD, scroll down where it says it's installed and then delete it. And instead, I'm now gonna to try to install this from the command line. Now, all of these plugins are provided just as normal dev install packages. So I should just be able to install them using the apt utility. This seems to have worked successfully. Let's now return to the web UI and see if that's made a difference. If I go to the storage section and then multiple devices, here you can see that my MD127 device is now visible. So this is great, but it does go to show that some of these plugins are a little bit flaky. Since this one actually restarts the Open Media Vault engine, that's why the connection is lost part way through. And it doesn't seem to be able to recover from that. So if you encounter this with any other plugins, then just do exactly what I did and install them from the command line instead. You can see the package name that you need during the install process. So it's really nice that Open Media Vault shows that. Now, just one other thing I want to point out here just before we move on is that you can check the status of the physical hard drives with this smart section. If you open that up and go to devices, then you can see the status of all the actual hard drives. So if anything goes wrong with these, then you can see what's going on. And also you can get a reflection of what the temperature is on each drive. In this case, everything's more than comfortable. So everything's running just fine. Now we have our meta device visible. The next thing that we need to do is create a file system. Now there's already a file system on our meta device. And so we can just mount that directly. We can just select this little arrow here to mount an existing file system. 
and then we can select our MD127 meta device and let's just give it a tag called NAS. Hit save. And there, our file system comes online. Now, after making any change like this, you have to apply them through clicking the tick in this yellow banner. And whilst we're here, let's also mount the backup disk. So now we have both our meta device and our backup disk mounted. Let's go and take a quick look on the terminal and see what that looks like. Here I can run df minus k, and in these last two entries, you can see that our NAS disk and our backup disk are both now mounted. Now we have this done, we need to create a shared folder. And here again, you just hit the create plus icon. Here, let's give this a name called NAS. We can select our NAS file system. And in this next entry, we can say whereabouts on this storage we're going to share. Now I want the whole of this file system to be available. So I'm just going to make this the root. And again, I'm just going to apply a tag called NAS. Now, just before I apply these changes, I'm going to also create a shared folder for the backups. And I do this in exactly the same way. And now I can just go ahead and apply these changes. Now that's done, we can actually start sharing out the file system. For this, I go into Services, and then I select the entry for SMB slash SIFS. And first off, I want to click on Settings. I want to enable this service, but everything else I'm just going to leave as default and hit Save. I'm then going to hit the Shares menu option, and I'm going to add a new one. Now under Shared Folder, I'm going to select my NAS entry, and then under Comment, I'm just going to give that a name. I'm going to say this is not a public share because I want anyone that connects to it to have to provide a username and password. So I'm just going to scroll straight to the bottom and hit save. And then apply the changes. Now the share is created, but I need to provide some security around it. And that's in the form of user accounts. So I'm going to go to the users menu and the users option and I'm going to create a new user. I'm going to call them NAS user. I'll provide a dummy email address and I'll just make the, the password the same as the username. This of course is really bad practice, but I'm only using this internally. Now under the groups, I'm going to scroll down to an option where it says Samba shares and select that and then scroll a little bit further and select the users box. I'm then going to save that. And again, apply the changes. Now the user is created, I need to associate that with our shared file system. In order to do this, I have to go back to storage, come down to shared folders, and then select our NAS share. And here there are two options I need to set further. One is permissions and the other is access control list. So if I hit permissions first, then I select our NAS user and read write. I can then hit save. I'm then going to select NAS again and access control lists. Scroll down to the NAS user and again, click read write. And again, click Save. I'm then going to apply these changes. I should now be able to connect to this from a different machine and read and write files. Here, I'm logged into a different Linux box on my home network, and I should be able to mount the NAS directory with this command here. The minus T SIFS option just tells it the type of file system that's being used. This minus O line provides the username and the password that I need to use to connect to the NAS. The RW says that I want it to be mounted read-write, and the UID and GID options specify that I want it to be mounted as my user, in this case Jeff. This will ensure that I can then read and write to that file system. I then just provide the path to the file system, 
i.e. the NAS, and where on my local file system I want that to be mounted. If I run this, that then mounts, and I can check that with df k. And here you can see that the system is mounted absolutely no problem. Now let's try to create a file. So that's created a one gigabyte data file of random data. And now I'm just going to copy that to my home directory here. So here I've proven that I can both read and write to and from my NAS. Now let's take a look at some performance. Now, in order to get some performance stats, just like in my prior video, I'm going to create a little test script here on the Raspberry Pi. All this script does is exactly the same as what we did on the other Linux box just now. It just creates a one gigabyte data file of random data. Now, before I can run this, I need to set up this slash MNT slash NAS directory. If I look at the output of DF minus K, our NAS is already mounted on the system but it's in this horrible path. So I'm just going to take a copy of that path name and then I'm going to create what's called a symbolic link to it. And that just allows us to access places on either local or remote storage using a friendly name. Now, if I just go to the MNT slash NAS directory, I can see that I'm on our NAS here and I can access it as if it were just natively mounted there. Now I can return to my other Linux box and actually run a meaningful test. This is the command that I'm going to use to run this test. Initially, it uses SSH to connect to the Raspberry Pi. It then executes that create file script. This will then create a test file on the NAS. Back on our Linux box, I then time how long it takes to copy that data file into the current directory. I then remove it. I then run the same shell script on my Linux box here in order to create a new one gigabyte data file. And I time how long it takes to copy that onto the NAS. Now, as I mentioned in my last video, copying one gigabyte of data over gigabit networking should take around nine seconds each way. So let's see how well this does. And here you can see that the results are exactly as we expect. When we were reading the one gigabyte file from our NAS, then that took 9.2 seconds. And when we were writing to the NAS, that took 9.5 seconds, slightly longer, but still well within the remit of one gigabit networking. Now let's take a look and see how it performs on Windows. Here, I have a Windows 11 PC, and all I've done is I've used the map network drive functionality to connect to our NAS, providing the correct username and password. I've then got a local directory on the Windows 11 PC called NAS test. So first off, I'm going to just copy the test.data file that we created in our previous test over to our Windows box. And there you can see that the copy performance was roughly around 111 megabytes per second. And if you multiply that by 8 to get the megabits per second, it comes out just under 900. So at 900 megabits per second, the performance is slightly less than what I'd expect, but it's still pretty close. Now let's try pulling the file back in the other direction, so we write from the Windows storage back onto the NAS again. And here you can see I'm getting just as good performance. So far, we've been able to set up our NAS and prove that we can access that from a remote machine. Now, the other thing I want to do is set up the backup job that I can use to automatically back up the data on my NAS to that backup drive. And this is really easy. If you remember, when we were looking at file systems and shared folders, we set up our backup area. And now all I have to do is go into services and rsync. And now I can create a new rsync task to back up our data once a week. Here, I just click Create. I select our source shared folder as being our NAS, our destination shared folder as being backup, and then we just need to set the time and day that we want it to run. By default, this has happened to pick up the current time, which is 1.35 p.m. 
I actually want this to run at one o'clock in the morning every Sunday. So I'm going to set the minutes to zero. And I also have to deselect 35 that was selected automatically. I then want to set the hour away from 13 and instead make that one. And then the last option is day of the week. And here I need to deselect the asterisk, which means every day of the week. And instead select Sunday, which is when I want the backup job to run. And now I just have to hit save. And just as with everything else, apply the change. The backup job is now set up. I can prove it just by selecting this here and hitting the run button. Here, this has run the backup task and it's ended successfully. And I can prove that by going back onto our Raspberry Pi terminal. Now, if I do a DF minus K in here, I can see that our backup directory is mounted in this horrible name here. I'm going to do the same trick as we did with the NAS directory earlier, that I'm going to create a friendly name for it. And now if I go into the slash MNT slash backup directory and I do a listing, you can see in here that the test.data file that we created earlier is right here in that directory. So the backup ran successfully and indeed it will run at 1 a.m. every Sunday. Now, as I've demonstrated here, Open Media Vault is wonderful software. It's a little bit fiddly to use here and there. But on the whole, it's really, really great. And it's a wonderful way to manage your own NAS system. Now, everything I've done in this video today is really just scratching the surface with what it can do. One of the most exciting things that is available in this software is the ability for it to run Docker containers. Indeed, there's a plugin available that then exposes the whole Docker Compose functionality. So I'll be revisiting this project again later on in order to add to the functionality that I've got on my NAS, since there is so much processing capacity on the Pi 5. Running Open Media Vault takes up hardly any resource on the Pi 5, so there's plenty of processing capacity available to run all kinds of other services on there as well, and really make more efficient use of that Pi. But that's it for this video. Man 74 I do hope that this was useful to you and indeed to everybody else. Give it a go and let me know in the comments how you get on. While you're there, if you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to see more and hit that notification bell so you can be told when I put another video out. As always, if you've got any ideas for other projects that you'd like to see me do, just like Joe did, let me know in the comments as well. Thanks so much for watching till the end, and until next time, bye for now.